Well, we return tonight to Paul's letter to the Galatian churches. If you go ahead and open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. This letter is the earliest of all the New Testament epistles, and what a banger from the start, right? This letter is a verbal spanking, a tough love discipline of the Galatian believers. And while I'm sure no one is more grateful than Paul was that all of his letters didn't have to be this way, he did, though, show a real shepherd's heart for the people of God. As we looked at things last time, Paul has all the positive desires in the world for grace and peace to be upon the Galatian churches. He means nothing but good for his audience. He desires for them to know the grace and peace of God and for God to be glorified in them forever and ever. Paul loves these people, and that is not antithetical to having a stern tone of discipline. And that is where we have come to today. Paul opened with a greeting, affirming his authority to speak and his authority over them. Paul is no average Christian. He has a special appointment from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is not a self-appointed man. The one who raises and was raised from the dead gave him this commission, and he will continue to fulfill that commission in this letter. And so after a lovely greeting, we dive right in with the apostle into the meat of the letter. Let's start off by reading Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Let's start off with a discussion of a tone. I raise my voice, by the way, because I see exclamation points. So let's give exclamation to Paul's statements. Speaking of tone. Our effeminate Christian culture is obsessed with niceness, and there has been a proliferation of the tone police in our day. It's not about what you say, it's about how you say it. And while we absolutely want to care about how we say things, it is pure imagination that thinks sweetness is the only way to properly communicate. It is a delusion to believe that the best way to speak in every circumstance is nicely. Listen, if you are so convinced that you should never raise your voice or speak harshly at times to your children, you're doing it wrong. You do not have the mind of God. You do not have biblical precedent. There are times when great warning needs to yell at a child headed for the street. Stop! There needs to be an air of warning, of great care, but hardness. Perhaps you haven't paid attention to Paul's tone in the book of Galatians. Yes, we are to have kind and gracious speech. Yes, we are to turn away wrath through the gentleness of our words. But thou shalt always be nice is not the 11th commandment. We have to possess a more robust ability to think about our communication in context than that. We have to have a Jesus that flips over tables and speaks to some people in some situations with, you brood of vipers, you whitewash tombs, and get behind me, Satan. We have to recognize that vexation and disappointment and righteous anger and rebuke are all parts of human expression because we image God who demonstrates the same. Listen, when it comes to expressions of character, we are never allowed to say, well, God can do it, but we can't. That's not a passage in the Bible. What is in the Bible is Ephesians 5.1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. 
and every righteous expression, both of grace and of righteous indignation and responsibility to rebuke, we are to imitate God. And if you think that you can be nicer than God and never raise your voice or never show your displeasure and anger over sin, you're fooling yourself and you are more inclined, actually, I would argue, to lose it and to blow up when you shouldn't because you haven't given it a proper place in your thinking, in your emotions, and in your behavior. Yes, we must not sin, but it is not necessarily sin to be stern and forceful and indignant and, have an, and ha- even have an air of anger when it is righteously placed. And yes, you can and must have such righteous thoughts and reactions applied to life. We have to care about sin and especially in those we love. John Chrysostom of the fourth century writes, quote, Now that this epistle breathes an indignant spirit is obvious to everyone, even on the first look. But I must explain the cause of his anger against the disciples. Small and unimportant it could not be, or he would not have used such vehemence. For to be exasperated by common matters is the part of the little-minded, disagreeable, and peevish just as it is that of the more rod, uh, redolent and lazy to lose heart in weighty ones. Such a one was not Paul. Had that then was, uh, hard then was the offense which bothered him. It was a serious and momentous one which was estranging them all from Christ, as he himself says further on. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will profit you nothing. End quote. It's obvious to everyone on the first look that this letter has an air of indignation. And I love the way John Chrysostom put it here. If you're just exasperated at the little things, That's a character problem in you. But when it counts and when it matters, when when life and death are are truly on the line, you better have the right tone. You better have the right air about you. You you, you ought to have the, the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ towards that. Life and death were truly on the line here for the Galatians. Eternity was at stake. And the lives of men and women and boys and girls were truly being threatened. An indignant spirit and anger is a tone that is meant to be read in this letter. Here in verse 6, Paul indicts them for quickly deserting Christ. There are those present inside the congregation that are going to squirm in their seats when this letter is read out loud in the congregation. And, of course, by the way, sometimes that needs to happen to all of us at various times, doesn't it? We all ought to have a measure of a squirming feeling because the Word of God talks to us. Paul will defend himself, the authenticity of his calling, and the accuracy of the message he preached as he goes along. But in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That's a pretty confrontational tone of indignancy. Chapter 3, verse 3, are you so foolish? Chapter 4, verse 11, I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. Perhaps I have wasted my time. Modern English translation. Chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? Chapter 5, verse 12. I wish those who are troubling you would have a transgendered surgery and mutilate themselves. Oh, the vapors. Paul, you shouldn't speak that way. Paul, that's not very nice. Don't you know Jesus taught us to love our enemies? And he did. And it is this not God-breathed scripture. Did not Paul also say, be imitators of me as I am of Christ? There is a place for hard, tough, biting language. Paul is going to use it throughout this letter. Listen, we do not need to care 
about tone, but beware of the tone police. We do need, excuse me, we do need to care about tone, but I'm saying beware of the tone police. Those who want to dismiss you or shame you or reject the message because it is not packaged according to their sensibilities. We need to care about tone so as to have the right tone for the right occasion. But we need to have a recognition that there are occasions wherein we need a tough, disciplined, a tone of discipline. But sweet and sappy all the time is a manipulation and ordinarily only applies one way, right? It applies to you, but it doesn't apply to them. So beware of the tone police. Then in verse 6, Paul sets a particular tone by using a bit of confrontational bite. He is amazed. He is astonished. He marvels at how quickly they have deserted. A modern way to say it would be something like, I can't believe that you would do this so soon. We talked about this, right? right that's, that's, the, that's the modern, if you will, way of putting what Paul is trying to say here. What is the quickness he is referring to? Well, it appears Paul is referring to the brief interval between the time when Paul ministered and preached the gospel in the region and the people responded in faith and churches were planted. Between that time when he left and their accepting of false teachers has been now approximately one year. Paul has left and within approximately a year They've turned on Christ, deserting God. Obviously, a lot can happen in a year, but Paul notes that they have moved from the true gospel to a false gospel very quickly. It should humble us on this side of the cross because we can sometimes look down our noses at Israel too much. We remember when Israel was at Sinai. We sometimes forget that that's where we are in our study on Sunday mornings, the book of Exodus. The mountain is in smoke, the lightning flashes, the thunder, the ground shaking, the voice of God, the tables of the law written by the finger of God, the covenant that they agreed to receive. And before Moses even comes down the mountain, before the ink is dry, they have deserted God and Moses, and they turn to a false God in the form of a golden calf. And you go, how did you do that so quickly? And Paul to the Galatians goes, I'm amazed at how quickly you have deserted him. The Galatians had essentially done the same thing. I leave you guys for just a little bit and you've traded the living God for an idol of self-righteousness. But notice that Paul personalizes it, not to himself. He'll get to that. But by moving on to a different gospel, they are deserting someone. This isn't just a matter of something, it's a matter of someone. They have abandoned, they have turned away from, they have deserted him. This isn't trivial. This is about relationship. This isn't merely academic or something that we can just agree to disagree. This isn't just uh, a bunch of eggheads debating and hashing out something of not, not in any particular consequence. This isn't something that God is happy to say, well, <laughs> close enough. If you miss this, if you do not have the one true gospel, you have missed God, you've turned your back on Him. You may still have His name on the front of your building. You may still have His name on your business. You may have his name at the top of your stationery, but it all amounts to a lie at that point. If you go after a different gospel, you don't get to keep God. Paul says you are deserting him. If you get the gospel wrong, you do not have him, no matter how much you say you have him. Denominations in our country, want to claim that they have God. Pride event, 
people wanted to claim that they understood what God means in his scripture and what it means to have love. And yet if they do not have the true gospel, they have deserted God and they do not have him. Do you sense the serious tone that Paul is taking here? Desertion of him. Who is the him? The him, Paul says, is the one who called you by the grace of Christ. The Father or the Holy Spirit are not named, but as Douglas Moo points out, God the Father is always the subject of the verb kaleo when used in a theological sense. That is, God has called believers in the grace of Christ. Paul is saying you've deserted God who called you by the grace of Christ. Well, what is the nature of their desertion? They deserted God for a different gospel. They decided to go in a different direction. They understood the gospel to be one thing, but now they understood it to be something different. And here the gospel is the euangelion, the message of good tidings. It's a summary word that stands for positive news. The word points to a message that is not here elaborated on, but which the Galatians would have understood what Paul was referencing. Paul, when he speaks of the gospel, has one message in mind. Some people at this point want to fill in what the message is with all kinds of speculation. We don't have to speculate. It already involves, as stated in verse 1, Jesus risen from the dead. It's a crucified Christ risen from the dead. But in the rest of the letter, Paul will clarify the meaning of the gospel for all of us. And sadly, Paul says, you've gone after a different message of good news. A different message of good news. In essence, they were denying that the gospel message they received was true. But they have accepted another message of good news that they believe is actually true. But Paul says in verse 7, which is really not another. You've gone after another gospel, but it's not really another gospel. And why would Paul say it that way? Well, it's because the other gospel is not really good news at all. The message they are believing is not the good news that actually saves. It's a lie. And so listen, you have to be discerning. Not all promises of blessing bless. Not all messages of positivity positivity lead to positive outcomes. Not all promises of peace actually mean peace. Not all promises are true. Not everything that says it's good is good. And that is why you can't be deceived by tone. Joel Osteen is a great punching bag. As a great demonstration of a person with really great tone. And many have been deceived by him. He has an impact. He has influence. Some of you have family members who have been influenced by his tone. And so Paul says, you've got a different gospel message, but he's, he's essentially saying, it's actually only, there's actually only one gospel. There's only one message that is truly good and true. The gospel has an exclusive claim to good news. Because Jesus has an exclusive claim to being the way to God, doesn't he? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. And so Paul is saying, if it isn't the message of Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, and no other ways, then that message is false, and therefore it's bad news. Continue with me in verse 7. Paul says, only there are some who are disturbing you, And want to distort the gospel of Christ. The whole church doesn't need to be torn down. You have to deal with the sum. The churches aren't dead. The churches aren't gone. The entire thing is not gone apostate. There are some. They have influence. It's significant. Some influencers are distorting the gospel. They have a hearing. 
Some people are listening to them. A lot of people are listening to them. The word here has the idea of turning around, altering, or perverting. They are, they are twisting the one true gospel into something that isn't the gospel at all. The gospel takes you one way, and they are trying to alter your path, turn you around, round and round and round, so that you are dizzy and not recognizing the direction of the one true gospel. And so the gospel ends up being something else entirely. In essence, because there is only one gospel, and if you pervert it and you alter it, then there is no gospel at all. That's what Paul is getting at. You have one gospel to get right, and if you get it wrong, there is no other good news. And these people who are disturbing the Galatians have taken that one true gospel, they have distorted it, twisted it into some kind of freak. That's what they've done. It no longer resembles the true good news in Christ. Now in verse 8, I, I just really picture here a stern-faced father. Paul says, if we, that is, if any Christian leader, any Christian pastor, any apostle, Paul here sets up a scenario where someone with Christian credentials a recognized figure, an office holder, deconstructs their faith and preaches a different gospel. It says they, they, they've come to a better, different realization and understanding of what Paul means or what the gospel is or who Jesus is. This is the most realistic threat to the church. Yes, we can receive attacks from, the outs, from outside the church, but churches don't, don't typically respond to outside attacks by changing who they are. That's not normal. Churches change their messages and their ministries because of the compromise and the apostasy of Christian leaders. And Paul is saying, if any Christian leader if John MacArthur himself gets up and preaches a different gospel, no matter how much you have loved him, no matter how much he has blessed you and helped you, you consider him to be damned. That's the level of seriousness that Paul attaches to the necessity of getting the gospel right. Now, thankfully, we have a long track record with John MacArthur. I only use his name because we love him so much. But the point is, is that it's not about loving People, the, the, the ministers, the people with clout and large ministries and have written many books, it's not about them, is it? It's about the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if any man were to fall and to contradict the gospel, it doesn't matter what his name is, it doesn't matter how you have liked him, you are to consider him to be accursed. And the Apostle Paul includes himself in this admonition. He says, if we, we of, of course, includes the speaker. It includes me. And Paul here is including himself. The gospel is not the property or the invention of men. It is the message of Jesus Christ that has been handed down to the apostles. I like the way Vody Bauckham puts it. I don't write the mail, I deliver it. I receive the package, I receive the message, and the job of the person who receives it is to faithfully deliver it without messing it up. Without delivering a package that's torn, dented, broken. No, it's to deliver it as it was received. The gospel is not the invention or the property of men. It's the message of Jesus Christ handed down to the apostles. That message then was preached. And no one, not even the apostles themselves, have the authority to modify it, to go back on it and change it, to make it acceptable to the sensibilities of sinful men, or to change it in any way. But then Paul adds an extreme scenario to elevate the seriousness of his stern dad tone. 
He says, even if an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that contradicts the one that was first preached to them, they were to consider that angel to be cursed or damned. Now, Paul believes in angels from heaven. He believes in angelic creatures who may be manifested in bodily form on earth to men. He has believed in them his whole life. From being steeped in the Old Testament, Paul has a specific angelology. There's angels appearing to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. There's the angels that came to rescue Lot's family from Sodom in Genesis 19. And many others. And Paul is not just using fanciful hyperbole just to make a point. He is saying in the strongest terms, listen guys, that the true gospel has come into the world and it has been preached already. You can't undo what has been done. The gospel has been delivered and it has been preached. And there may be those who come with credentials. They may come with master's degrees and doctorates. They may come from the master's seminary or Westminster Theological Cemetery. That was a slip. That was a total slip. But that goes back to our old days when we used to refer to seminaries as cemeteries. But anyway, I digress. Or RTS. Or name your favorite seminary, or even if an angelic creature, so even if the, the most credentialed, educated man, he comes giving you a different, go- uh, different gospel, or even if an angelic creature contradicts that gospel, don't be fooled, Paul says. Listen to Barnes' commentary on this verse, quote, This is a very strong rhetorical mode of expression. It is not to be supposed that an angel from heaven would preach any other other than the true gospel. But Paul wishes to put the strongest possible case and to affirm in the strongest manner possible that the true gospel had been preached to them. The great system of salvation had been taught, and no other was to be admitted. No matter who preached it, no matter what the character or rank of the preacher, and no matter with what imposing claims he came, it follows from this that the mere rank, character, talent, eloquence, or piety of a preacher does not of necessity give his doctrine a claim to our belief or prove that his gospel is true. Great talents may be prostituted, and great sanctity of manner, and even holiness of character may be in error. And no matter what may be the rank and talents and eloquence and piety of the preacher, if he does not accord with the gospel which was first preached, he is to be accursed." End quote. I think he's making his point. Verse 9. I think this one's, to me, just a little bit funny. It's an I really mean it verse. If you didn't catch my seriousness, let me repeat myself. Verse 9. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. This is a serious letter. Paul already said it very strongly already, and by the Holy Spirit, he repeats himself. It's a serious letter, and and picture the audience that first received it. Kind of picture that wind-blown face and hair blown back like they just had received a great gust of hot wind. Imagine the people who were taught by Paul, converted under his ministry. Paul is their spiritual father, and their spiritual father just gave him a whooping. But who had been receiving and not dealing harshly themselves with false teaching? In in these four verses, Paul has referenced the gospel four times. That is what has got his dander up relates to the gospel. Today, it seems like everything is a gospel issue to our evangelical establishment. However, this truly was an overt attack on the gospel itself. 
Also notice all of Paul's negativity towards what has happened. Verse 6, deserting another gospel. Verse 7, disturbing you, distort the gospel. Verse 8, a gospel contrary. He is to be accursed. Verse 9, a gospel contrary, and he is to be accursed. And then notice that in verses 8 and 9, Paul emphasizes the medium of delivering the true gospel and the false gospel, and that is through preaching. This is getting into the heart of the letter. Has Paul made himself clear? Has he established the tone? There is one gospel. And every false gospel that is proclaimed is one that renders that preacher to be cursed, that is damned to hell, because it also condemns the hearer to hell should he believe the false gospel and not repent. Life and death and eternity are indeed at stake. Paul is writing to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, as Jude 3 calls for. And Paul has hope that the people will be rescued and turned back from the error that they are receiving. Why? Because genuine salvation will not ultimately apostatize, even if deceived for a while. Paul hasn't given up on them. That's what this letter is about. I'm not giving up on you. I'm coming after you. You're wandering away. But I have hope for you that if you will hear my words of discipline and correction, that you would listen. I want grace and peace and the glory of God to be from you and for you. A believer may be fooled, he may be deceived, but by the work of the Holy Spirit, through the efforts of faithful men, there is hope in the power of the one true gospel to save and to bring back those sheep who have wandered too far away from the shepherd. This letter is the shepherd's crook that is seeking to yank the naive sheep from the mouths of wolves. And you don't yank sheep from mouths without a little force, without a little aggression, without great love for the sheep who are being hurt by such wolves. Thanks be to God for faithful shepherds. May God grant us all wisdom and courage to fend off the wolves because families, fathers, you are shepherds and there are wolves who want your sheep. Thanks be to God for faithful shepherds of the church. May they continue to uphold their ministries and fend off wolves of the sheep. As Doug Wilson calls it, we need to be preaching a hot gospel, a gospel that actually has Holy Spirit fire in it and not a room temperature gospel that is dead and cannot make anyone alive. May false false teachers be damned according to the good purpose of God and may we all love the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, this is a sobering entrance into the heart of the book we do see the heart of a father and of a shepherd of an apostle in the tone that Paul takes and we recognize it to be a righteous tone and true words calling for a true commitment to the one true faith the only gospel that saves So, Lord, may we be sober-minded. May you give us strength and courage. May we not shrink back from disappointments over someone's tone. May we be most dedicated to the truth, however we receive it. May we have proper tones for the right moments, for the right people. May we not be unkind or harsh unnecessarily or selfish in the way in which we express our anger or anything else. But Lord, may we be self-controlled under the control of the Holy Spirit. 
that we might know how we are to behave and to think and to talk in whatever moment we have. And as we see the seriousness of life and death, Lord, may we have a a seriousness, strength about us to do whatever is necessary for the sake of love of the one we communicate to. For we are representatives of our Savior who has left us here to fulfill our ministries. And we ask that you would be pleased with us and may your true gospel, the one once for all delivered to the saints and preached in the world, may it continue to go forth with boldness. May your spirit call out from the world those whom you intend to save. And may we see a great movement and revival and reformation in our day. For the sake of your glory and name, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.